What up, what up? Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. And today we spoke with a six-figure crowdfunder. So this is someone who's been able to do a six-figure campaign when it comes to crowdfunding. And we're specifically talking about Kickstarter and how you can launch an entirely new product, an entirely new brand using this platform and using this website. And really, how do you get a river of funding? How do you get a ton of people behind your project? This individual is able to track more than 1,300 backers for their campaign, people who are actually buying into their idea, who want to see this product created and really want to support that creation as well as own the product at the end of the day. So today you're going to kind of discover not only some of the insights from this designer who actually was able to create a whole new product from scratch, but also some of the things that they did when it comes to the marketing side of the equation. How did they get traffic? How did they promote this? You're also going to hear from today's podcast guest a lot about what you got to do if you want to be successful. So this is actually not their first product. They've created a couple of other products and they really lend some really interesting insights in my opinion when it comes to creativity and actually coming up with a product idea that no one else has come up with before. So if you've ever been wondering like how do I either improve my product, how do I come up with a new product idea or is my product a good fit? These are some great ways in which you can really understand what you got to do in order to get this out there quickly and also something that's completely innovative and something new. So for those of you out there that really want to kind of bust through into a new industry, I think this is going to be an incredible episode for you. And if you really want to stand out, you're going to take away a lot of tips when it comes to this. So first of all, I really appreciate you, man, for tuning into the podcast. My name is Salvador Brinkman, and I've been doing this podcast for a while now. One of the reasons that I do is that I know that when you're trying to accomplish something, when you're in those kind of grind, right, when you're in that boot camp, you got to train every single day. And it's almost like your life depended on it. And it's not your life, right? But it's like the life of your product really depends on you training every single day. You know, the only way to win, the only way to smash your goal on Kickstarter, the only way to really blow past any of your expectations is to make sure that you train. And that's why I wrote my book, The Kickstarter Launch Formula, is to help you train, to help you read more, to help you become understanding of how to actually launch one of these campaigns and to really become obsessed. I think that lack of obsession, lack of training is actually what leads to failure so often because a lot of times we will actually you know, try to do something and we don't understand the road ahead. We don't understand some of those pitfalls that are around the next corner. And if you just train, if you just read, if you just listen to podcasts, if you just kind of are more aware of what you got to do going forward, it makes it so much more likely that you are going to be successful when you put this thing out there and you're not going to fail and the thing's not going to unfortunately kind of fall short. How horrible would it be, right, if you launch one of these campaigns and like no one backs it or no one actually checks it out or no one even really cares? In my opinion, the secret to success when it comes to crowdfunding, Kickstarter, or even just coming out the new product, it's not necessarily about hard work, though hard work is, is certainly required. It's not even necessarily about luck. I think it's actually understanding how the engine works, right? If you're trying to get a result, the more you can understand the system and the processes that go into producing that result, the easier it's going to be for you to just replicate that, right? And that's literally, I would say, one of the most common denominators that I've seen of all the people on this show, of all the people that have passed through any of my books, my readers, people who have seen success, people who are kind of getting at those high levels where we look at it and we're like, oh my gosh, six figure crowdfunding, right? They all have this in common where not only were they willing to put in the work, not only were they willing to train, that they believe in themselves, but they had the guts to go out there and actually do that. And that's really what I try to do on this show is number one, provide you with education. Number two, get you a little bit inspired to go out there and launch something new. So that being said, if you are interested in learning more and going beyond just this podcast, I do have a great book out there, The Kickstarter Launch Formula, which you can check out on Audible. And if you want, you can also get a free 30-day trial of Audible and you can actually download a free copy of The Kickstarter Launch Formula. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to include a link right now where you can go and check that out. All you got to do is go to crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter audio. That link is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash Kickstarter audio crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio and that's a great place to get started in addition i have so many other resources out there i got a free kickstarter course you can go to crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter enter your name and email you can get access to my free videos warming you up to how to launch one of these campaigns that being said let's get right into the interview and learn how this individual was able to raise six figures with crowdfunding and it's coming up right after this if you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your kickstarter campaign when it comes to Getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured, I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight, and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal 
going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com slash checklist. Fulfillright.com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Today we have the privilege of speaking with a campaign that's already raised over $95,000 on Kickstarter for more than 1,200 backers. This is for Rollable Bicycle Mud Guards. And we also have the creator here today on the show. Yuri, welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Definitely, man. Why don't we get started? Maybe you could tell listeners just a tiny bit about how you came up with this product idea and identified the problem. So it all started back in about 2012. Mm -hmm. I was still uh, studying design back then and uh, somehow got into bikes. On my, I did a studying exchange in Milan. So that's where I learned a lot about fixed gear cycling, which was a big thing at the time. And I got the bike and then pretty soon I realized I needed a mudguard for it. And mm -hmm. like doing a little bit of a research, going around shops, I noticed that none of the guards really matched the aesthetic or like the minimalism of those bikes, you know, because they're really clean. They most times don't have brakes or they don't have uh, gears even. So there's really, you know, everything is super streamlined. And so since I was studying in product design, I'm an industrial designer by trade, by profession. I... Uh, challenged uh, i tackled the problem i knew a little bit about this material i did stuff out of polypropylene sheets before and uh, it just came natural to me you know to, to solve this problem myself and i did a little crude like a mock-up like a little model mm -hmm. and i tried it out wrote it and it worked fine and then some other people saw it and the whole thing uh, snowballed from there was this your first product that you have made no i was still studying but i did projects in between like freelance even while I was still studying, but this so this project uh, was like dragged out a little bit because when I came back from this exchange to Slovenia, I finished my studies with this project as well. Also working in the meantime, freelancing. And it was my graduation project, and uh, pretty soon after that, I met a guy called Nico Klanchek who introduced me to Kickstarter. So in 2013, we did the first Kickstarter campaign with, with the same product, more or less. So it was a rollable mud, only meant for the bikes I was talking about. So fixed gear bikes at first, all this uh, urban cycling was still uh, like a, a big trend at the time. And mm -hmm. that's uh, mm -hmm. how we established the company. So you launched this campaign in, in 2013, the first time around. How did that campaign yeah. go, the one you launched? So that one went pretty amazing. So the, the platform was pretty fresh. I didn't know what to expect at all. We just made the campaign so the best the best I knew how to, you know, presenting the project, made the video. I had uh, the privilege of having some friends who were uh, videographers, who made really like professional videos uh, for, uh, for advertising agencies and stuff like that. So we mm -hmm. made a pretty good video for that. And the campaign went really well. So it, uh, it got a lot of attention from uh, Kickstarter itself and uh, the media. And how much did you end up raising with that campaign? We raised a little bit over forty thousand dollars, but at the time, it completely that was completely unexpected. We had about thousand seven hundred uh, backers. That's awesome, man! Yeah, congrats, definitely on that. And did that kind of launch the initial phase of the business, or were you still kind of doing freelancing on the side, or like what happened after that successful campaign? Yeah, so definitely launched the the idea of the business you know and uh, like made me believe that this could actually grow into something bigger which i didn't really uh, expect i thought it would be just a project yeah so it took me a little bit uh, a little bit of a time to, to switch between freelancing and uh, doing this actually full time but it all went pretty natural i still freelance because uh, i'm a designer i like to design stuff i just have the privilege like since this project started i just had the privilege to you know maybe uh, choose projects a little bit more yeah yeah be a little bit more selective. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, also, I think it's really exciting to be able to create your own brand and your own product. What did that feel like when you finally were able to have other people around the world using the first iteration of your product? What was that like? Yeah, it was. I wasn't so. I'm, I'm not the kind of guy that's too confident. So I don't know. Maybe a lot of designers have this problem, but I knew that the product worked well, but I didn't know how the people would react. What if somebody would notice some. I don't know, minor flaws, but the feedback was really good. And that's how I gradually build up my confidence 
and just accepted the project as like as a, as a full as a full time thing. So the brand was pretty established. Mm -hmm. It was kind of easier for me because I was interested in this field of cycling myself, heavily involved mm -hmm. into like riding and racing. Yes, yeah, so I was passionate about it. I knew the crowd pretty well. I knew who the people were to talk to, who to connect with. It was all pretty natural. So the like I only I could say I mostly had good experiences, good uh, good interactions with the people I really respected. You know. Yeah, for sure. So, do you think that people really connected with this because it solved a really big problem? Do you feel like it was because of the design, the aesthetic that you have? What do you really think people liked about it when you first launched it in 2013? Uh, I think it was a little bit of everything. Got it. Uh, I mean, it addressed this problem, which obviously people had, and then it solved it. And then the way it solved it also uh, had a part in it, I think. So using as minimal material as possible, the design was stripped down to like only the essential parts that were needed for it. That's actually my design process is like playing around in the material and then going really far, really complicating stuff. And then bringing it back down, so stripping it of all unnecessary details, and then just ending up with something really clean and streamlined. And yeah, I love that, man. That's so cool, and uh, very well thought out. Obviously, the design. So when it comes to this, you know, I think one of the big concerns about a lot of beginning creators is that, hey, I have a great campaign right here, like Yuri, and we put this out there. What's going to stop people from you know stealing this? Did you have any issues when it comes to IP after that initial raise in terms of people trying to rip you off or people trying to sell your product over the last couple of years? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it was really a problem at the beginning because I think it's such a still such a niche product. I would say we never had really like like direct copycats like some campaigns had because the campaign itself, you know, we it didn't it wasn't like huge like some campaigns were. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time, maybe we, which got ripped off right away, and even were sold before they were actually made by the original creators on Kickstarter. You probably heard those stories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, well, luckily we never had those problems. But we we filed for a bunch of uh, for a bunch of uh, patents. What do you call them? Patents, yeah, yeah, and uh, trademark the name. And after that point, did you then decide to kind of go down the foray of building your own? store out or was were you going into amazon like what was your thought process of really where, where you wanted to go with this after that first campaign yeah i just wanted um, to get it out there so just get it to the end user as best I, I i knew how to so like our own store was never a, a goal because it's you know it's just one product after all but i know there were a lot of bike shops and the bike shops in the bicycle circles are places where people gather, you know, it's a bigger, it's, it's not just a shop, it's like a, it's a social thing. So I knew a bunch of those and contacted them and got into a bunch of those stores and got represented where I wanted to and positioned the brand well after that. So, yeah. Yeah. So you were definitely able to get uh, distribution and those different things. One other quick question, you know, when it comes to like your online store, do you have any preference when it comes to Wix or Shopify or any of these other platforms that are out there? I'm pretty slow with that. Actually, we started off with the, with the service that uh, it's not in existence anymore, and switched uh, to Shopify in between. And I'm pretty uh, satisfied with that. I think it's a versatile platform. It uh, performs well. It's uh, safe. People know it, so they trust it. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, we we never experimented with that too much. Awesome. So, you know, you've had a lot of success here. You know, I'm looking at your Instagram. You got over 10,000 followers. You got people who are posting about this. You're doing something you're passionate mm -hmm. about, you love. You got some cool shots, right? Yeah. What really did you improve with the second product that you launched on Kickstarter? What do you feel like you really added to this that made people want to rally behind the second campaign? Uh, okay. Yeah. So the main thing with this second model is actually going past the boundaries of this niche cycling category right so the the product worked best on the bikes i was talking about and now this uh, new model needed to work on a much broader i wanted it to work on a much broader array of, of bicycle types and that's difficult you know because there's a lot of different bikes out there yeah and making something universal for for a bike is much more difficult than one would imagine probably you know because there's so much different details on uh, different bike uh, manufacturers 
and uh, riding styles, for instance, you know, if you have, that's all really broken down these days. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, you have a specific bike for almost every activity, every type of surface you want to ride. So that was the main challenge with this. And we managed to tackle it. So I managed to design this, this folding system, which keeps the new mudguard sturdy on almost all kinds of bikes. And what I'm trying to say with this is that it can be mounted on a seat post, which is actually the, like the most universal part of the bike still. So the, that's a little pole that holds the seat. How, how long does that process take where, you know, you, you recognize that you need a new product, right? You need a new version that's going to work with more types of bikes, right? When you're really starting to do the creative brainstorming and thinking about ways to solve this problem, how long does it take? Is that like a two year span? Is that a six month span? Like how long are you really spending yeah. working to solve that problem? So yeah, it's about a year span, I would say. And then half a year is really, really intensely perfecting the the end product but yeah and it's a it's a strange process because i knew i wanted to do this and there was no other way than to sit down and start working you know start start cranking out yeah getting that work yeah start cranking out and then you're of course not like there's a lot of dead ends yeah on the way right you do this you try a bunch of difference and you're not happy with it like either by the function or the looks of it and then there are these eureka moments every now and then Unfortunately, it happened, and then you end up with something which you're hopefully happy with and uh, confident enough to to release on the market, right? Have you ever read that one book? I think it's called The Dip by Seth Godin. Have you ever read that? No. no. Okay, so well, that book is all about how a lot of the times when you're creating something new, you go through this uh-huh. period where you're not sure if it's going to work out, right? And then if you persist yeah. and it does work yeah. out, like you get massive dividends from doing that. So. For you, oh, cool. definitely check that out. Yeah, is is there ever like a point in time when you're going through and trying to solve that problem where you ever question, hey, maybe I can't figure this out, or do you just keep persisting and oh. like following through? Yes, exactly, all the time. That's the hardest part, like persisting. Mm-hmm. You know, just coming to the studio uh, late at night, despite not wanting to go, and you know, just uh, being you know in a bad mood, like in a really in a dead end sort of. And then just coming anyway and something magical happens. That's like what I think most great people are after. Yeah, for sure. And then obviously, you know, getting this thing and trying it out with so many different types of people, I imagine. I'm sure you go through a lot of iterations, all that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. And it's like the amount of models I did for this new, so the Masgard Omni, that's about like 50, 60 models before. That's crazy. On the final one. That's crazy, yeah. man. But that that's so cool because that, that obviously says that you put so much thought and work into just making this one product that's so streamlined that works well with all these different types of bikes, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's my approach. And I think a lot of other creatives out there too, hopefully. So one of the things that I've noticed, certainly I'm sure you have as well, is just the fact that the ecosystem around Kickstarter has changed a lot over the years, right? When it comes to this launch, you're obviously way more successful than your first. How do you feel like crowdfunding has changed? How do you feel like the platform has changed since your first launch in 2013? So the gap between our campaigns was quite big. And it changed a lot, yeah. So in the meantime, I was I spoke to the people who, who had campaigns, so I knew a little bit what, about what was going on, how the platform functioned. In between, yeah, but when we started working on this, I started learning about all this, you know, more or less like challenging the algorithm stuff, I would say, or adapting to the to the laws of how uh, these platforms work these days. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, and what would you say from those conversations, one or two takeaways that you had were? But the fact that it's so parametric now got a little bit, was really strange to me. You know, so that you have like, that there was a formula to it. You know exactly how many, how many followers or, you know, how many people on your uh, newsletter you needed for a certain amount of, uh, of uh, funds to be raised. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was amazed at how, how direct that is, you know, and everybody knew about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, I think in some ways, so Kickstarter changed in, in the, in the poetry <laughs> it had in the beginning, you know, which was just like. I make something which I think people would like and you post it up and then fingers crossed and hopefully people like it and it happens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Almost like these days it's a lot more homework. Yeah. mm -hmm, yeah, Almost like, you know, in some ways making the process more scientific, but also taking some of that, like you said, poetry out of it. Yeah, exactly. When it comes to that formula, are there any insights that you can share that you learned 
related to that formula which you just spoke of? Uh, yeah, the, the thing is, I'm really bad with numbers. I'm not a number guy. Unfortunately, I have co-workers for that now, so I couldn't uh, tell you the exact formula. Okay, got it. But uh, it's definitely the amount of people on your on your like followers list somehow transfers to like what you can expect at a certain uh, price point of a product, right? Got it. So, so basically, the the formula goes into the number of people you need on a launch list in order to secure a certain amount of funding. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. And would you consider that to be like the pre-launch, or you know, what do you consider that phase to be? Exactly. A pre-launch is a big thing. So you actually need to finish the the project way before you actually launch. And it's also quite challenging if you're a kind of person that's, you know, never super certain of something and you keep changing the product itself in the last minute, mm. which was the case, of course. For, for you guys, when did you really start to introduce this new product to your existing community of people who had bought your... Not so uh, long before the launch, actually. I think we we caught like the last the last acceptable deadlines for that. I would say a month before maybe. Okay, got it. Understood. And building up the excitement, uh, telling all the uh, telling everybody who's interested in our product that we've got something new coming, and mm -hmm. talking a little bit to the media. So a month maybe. So like the suggested uh, periods for that are much longer. You know, it's like oh, three four months before. Yeah, yeah. Setting everything up for the launch to be successful. Yeah. So, you know, you've put a year of nights and weekends, you know, into making this yeah. new thing and, you know, you've been testing it out and you've gotten through all these hurdles, you go live and it, it really does start to resonate, right? But I think it's in the first week uh -huh. you kind of got past that old goal you had. What, what did that feel like to kind of get to that milestone? Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing, I must say, because yeah, it's such a, such a steep curve. Mm -hmm. That uh, you almost uh, can't believe it, and it's exciting. Yeah, it gets your uh, blood flow going. I must say, yeah. And did you have an internal team as well? Now it sounds like as well, kind of working with you a little bit. Yeah, of course. Uh, we're now three people. It's, we're still a small company. It's only three people. It's me and my wife and a uh, coworker, and we got a bunch of uh, guys helping us out with like packing and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a small operation. Still, still more or less community based here in uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia. We have. We, Got a nice little bike community. Uh, yeah, so everybody kind of joins in, you know, helps one way or another. Yeah, that, that's so exciting. And, and I assume, you know, you guys were just celebrating, right, when you were able to get to that goal in such a short time span. Yeah. And then you keep climbing. You yeah. keep climbing, man. You keep going going up and up with this. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually where the, where the real work starts then, right? Yeah. I mean, so in the, the first couple of days when things are going great, that's when you can, like, a little bit relax a little bit mm -hmm. and then it's back in the cockpit yeah things need to be carefully monitored and you know what advertising pays uh, plays a big role now you know like uh, the social media advertising mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah and, uh, answering questions and you know all of that when it comes to you know slovenia you know i think a lot of people are kind of nervous about launching a project if they're not from the united states but it sounds like for for you oh. That really didn't have any kind of, you know, bearing on the project. It almost, it's almost didn't matter where you were launching. Yeah, that's the that's the thing. Uh, so Slovenia, for some reason, has uh, a big Kickstarter community and a lot of successful projects, and a lot of people who were really successful on the platform on all on all levels, like from quite, I'd say, businesses which were in existence for a long time and have a really, uh, like, are doing technologically more demanding projects and products to art projects as well and once again yeah it, it's it's such a small place that the community formed around it uh quite it's been going strong for since the beginning i think like for almost 10 years there's this my, my friend who i was talking about nico klanschek has a lot to do with it because he's also connected to the kickstarter people mm -hmm. so they know about it they know slovenia is a thing in the Kickstarter universe, and we also we had a local event with people from Kickstarter visiting Slovenia. That's really cool. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you have any thoughts as to why that is? Is it just the fact that you know people are so close and they're having conversations, or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a big part. Is like people willing to share information and uh, you know tips, and the other 
party is just the fact that we as such a small country and such a small market, Kickstarter is really in, comes really handy in that sense, you know, because it's a really good pathway to, to the global market. Yeah. And, you know, just people here are capable enough to develop uh, projects which uh, resonate with the worldwide audience. Very cool. Very cool. So when it comes to this process, a lot of people look at you and they're probably like, this is incredible. This guy was able to, you know, get to 95K and you obviously have a really cool product. Do you have any tips or advice that you would pass on to a beginning creator who kind of like you initially is now thinking about going on to the Kickstarter platform? Do you have any thoughts or tips you'd like to pass on? Yeah, well, I couldn't really say. I mean, not a lot of homework needs to be done these days for Kickstarter, I'd say. So besides like developing a, a cool, like really well thought out project or product, I'd say like do the homework these days. Like read online, listen to all the YouTube tutorials with tips. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, just educate yourself on the way the platform works these days because it's different, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So make sure you're aware of what to do in terms of the best practices, just to be aware kind of of what to do on the platform, right? Exactly. So it needs to be approached as a as a really developed system. Got it, got it. So, so for you, you know, you've obviously gotten to the point in your career where you have a successful product, you have a successful ecosystem. Where do you as a creator or designer or a inventor, where do you feel like you're next step for it is with this career is it to deliver on more and more bike accessories are you uh thinking of expanding your company what are your thoughts on really what you want to do now so uh, both definitely uh Bootcard is going to remain a brand that's going to deal with uh, bikes and accessories developing uh, accessories we've got a lot of ideas for those and uh, hopefully realize them as soon as possible and yeah, also I want to challenge. I want the challenge of uh, tackling other problems, other other fields as well. Definitely. So I'm gonna try to 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 make both. It sounds exciting, you know, and also sounds like a lot of this marketing that you've done might even spill over to helping with that, you know, when it comes to the campaign you're currently doing. Hopefully, yeah. Cool. Awesome, man. I'm really excited to continue to see your progress here. You know, when it comes to your project, where can people go to learn a little bit more about your campaign here? Yeah, so the campaign itself would be the best place to to get acquainted with our company and the, the product. We need to work a little bit on our web page, which is a little bit outdated, I would say. And that's all the, the following steps after the campaign. So updating the, the, the web image. Okay, so they can go to um, Muscard Omni, right? And search that. Uh, that's Muscard.com, which is going to remain the, the, the same. Okay. It's the same landing. Yeah, muscard.com. We can make sure to link that up. You know, final question for you is you've gotten to a point where you're executing your ideas, which I think is the coolest thing, right? You have an idea and you actually take action on it and it comes into the real world. And a lot of, the, I mean, I think that's kind of like a superpower, right? That's almost like magic. It's like you can bring this thing that was in your head and it then exists in the real world, right? And other people can use that. Yeah. Do you have any final yeah, or closing, either a word of encouragement or something you wish you knew at the beginning of the journey or a final tip that you'd like to leave the audience with when it comes to that? Yeah, so definitely just go for it, you know, don't stop. Just try to realize it, just work on it. Because like, as I was talking with the, with the design process itself, with all the dead ends, you know, and all the, the blocks that get surpassed one way or another, it's the same like with the, with, with the approach to the whole the whole creative process in, in any field, I would, I would say. And then you need to know that like there's a lot of work after you get the, the creative part done also. So nobody should underestimate that. So the funniest thing to me is when people say, like they want to share ideas because they're afraid that somebody's going to steal them. You know, and it's, you know, they, it's just, they clearly don't have any, any idea on how much work goes into like releasing something successfully even after you had that idea. You know what I mean? So you're almost saying that there are a lot of steps between having an idea and getting it out there, right? Exactly, yeah. And why do you, why do you think it's so important for people to talk about those ideas they have? Uh, it's just better. I think it's better if you, if you uh, put your ideas out there and talk them through with uh, like a lot of different people with different aspects. It just uh, benefits the whole project. In doing that yourself, just as a quick follow-up here, did you 
come to any new realizations when you were sharing that your ideas or did you have any epiphanies through doing that yeah yeah definitely definitely i mean conversation i think is the best uh, way of uh, speeding up the creative process well said well said awesome man well thank you so much for coming on the show um really appreciate it and good luck with your next 11 days here looks like you're already killing it I, also based by just the trend it's probably going to hit that six figure mark so i'll be looking for that and excited to hear to see that thanks thanks a lot thanks for having me once again thank you for listening to this episode of the crowdfunding demystified podcast again my name is salvador Brigman. thank you for joining me here today on the crowdfunding demystified podcast and one of the things that so often i hear is someone is trying to have a really big goal they're trying to achieve something they're trying to accomplish something but at the same time they don't believe they can actually get better at anything in life they don't believe that if they were to actually spend a little bit of time learning something that they can learn things that they didn't know before didn't know previously and i think that whenever you've gotten to that place in your life where you quit learning you quit training you quit reading you quit listening you quit watching videos it's almost like you've kind of given up. It's almost like you're just admitting to the world that you can't get any better, that you can't figure this out. However, at the same time, I really do empathize because it is difficult to learn a new discipline. It's hard to learn a new process. And when I was first getting started in this industry, that's kind of what I felt as well. So I was like, you know what? We really need to put some simple education out there to help people from a step-by-step -step framework, really just kind of the nuts and bolts as well as kind of, you know, making this thing just easy to understand when it comes to launching a Kickstarter campaign. And that led to my work, obviously, with my blog, crowdcrux.com, that led to this podcast, that led to my YouTube channel, that led to my book, The Kickstarter Launch Formula. And this has been my like mission. This has been my goal is to make this easy for you and to demystify the entire process. However, at the same time, you might have that commitment. You might know that you got to train if you want to win. You got to train if you want to smash through your goal. You got to train if you really want to make sure that you're able to achieve your objectives, right? And it's probably not even about you necessarily. Like most of the people that I speak with on coaching calls, most people that I speak with on the podcast, they're not really super money motivated. Like obviously money is a great thing and getting funding is amazing. And we want that. We want that outcome. We want to have success. We want to you know, push through our barriers and really get to that ultimate goal of raising either six figures or a million dollars with a crowdfunding campaign, right? And maybe it's not even that. Maybe you just want to do two, you know, five figures. You want to you know, do a 20K campaign or 50K campaign. It doesn't matter. Money is part of the equation, but rarely is it the thing that's the center of why someone is actually doing it. More often than not, they want to bring a new product into the world. More often than not, they want to bring their creation, something they've created, to have other people experience that. And think about that, just denying the ability for other people to experience your work, it's kind of selfish in some ways if you've really created something that you feel like a lot of other people are going to benefit from. So there's almost this like obsession that you have to have and your friends and family might be like, why is this guy so obsessed with this? Until they begin to see those results, right? And then people don't question it as much. Then it's like, wow, he's really focused, right? But at first when you're just kind of getting started, it's like, why is he so obsessed, right? Or why is she so obsessed? I think this is healthy. I think this is actually a good thing because it really is at the end of the day, not only about out training everyone, but it's also about being willing to commit to a future and just having the guts to go after it, right? So while you might have that, and I do think that pretty much I'd say 99% of my community is committed. You wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you weren't committed to training yourself, if you weren't excited about the future, and if you didn't actually want to put in the work to get something out there that other people can use and benefit from in their life. However, there is always that missing component, right? No matter how much you train, sometimes you just still it doesn't click for you in some ways and you would really benefit from more personalized attention. So that's why I do my one-on-one -on -one coaching calls where we go intensive into your specific project, your specific product, your category, what you're trying to do. A lot of the times I also have people who will actually bring on their teammates onto these calls, which is completely okay if you want to do that. As long as they show up on time, I have no issues with that. And we really run through exactly what you got to do every step of the way and you probably, if you've been listening to the Kickstarter launch formula or this podcast, you know, you know certain things, but there's still some gaps maybe in your knowledge. And this is literally the best investment that you can make in your business, in you, your trajectory, your life, your career. So many often I'd say the majority of our calls are about tactics and strategy and tools and resources and that kind of stuff. You know, really the, the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty that goes into crowdfunding. But there's then kind of like this bonus, I guess, that a lot of my students will have, which is coming out of that call, man, they just feel inspired. They just feel excited. They just feel confident to go out there and to conquer the world. And I love seeing that effect and to be able to even have the privilege to have that effect on some people who are on these calls. So sometimes it is tactics, training, et cetera. 
Other times, there's just something that's holding you back. So we do all that. I identify all of that. I've been coaching for a long time now and I have a whole methodology behind this. So if this sounds interesting to you and you want to book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me, this is for people that are launching Kickstarter campaigns, Indiegogo campaigns. Um, it could be even something like a board game. It could be something like an artistic product, like a new book that you're coming out with. It really anything under the sun when it comes to launching and trying to raise money with crowdfunding. You can go to this link I'm about to mention. You can book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call. You just got to go to this link at crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That link is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash coaching, crowdcrux.com slash coaching. Go there, fill out a little bit of information about your project so that I know more and I can be prepared for our intensive call and we can get that scheduled ASAP. And also I'm going to give you some homework items and you also get some downloads and stuff like that when you go through that link. So you can go again, crowdcrux, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash coaching and you can book your one-on-one -on -one call there. Thank you so much, man, for tuning in. I really appreciate you. Hope you have a great week and I will see you next time.